So before we start to talk about aging, I just want to, I think a lot of people already asked you this question, but I'm sure um, it's interesting for everyone to know how you ended up at the MIT at such a young age, and what made you so, what drove you basically to focus on this aging field, and uh, what your ma motivation is to make us all live forever. Yeah, so it's a bit of a crazy story. Um, I grew up in New Zealand originally, and I lived there until I was 12 years old. And I remember one time uh, my grandma came to visit us, and I had never hung out with uh, somebody who was over the age of 60 before. And so <laughs> when she came, I remember for the first time realizing, you know, when I go and I play with my brother, you know, I can run around and I can roughhouse, but my grandma just getting up from a chair is really painful for her. And that struck me as, oh, she has a disease, like we should try to find a way to cure her so she can come and play with us. And then I remember asking my parents, what disease does grandma have? And they said, oh, she doesn't have a disease, she's just old. Hmm. And I was like, what disease is that? And they were like, no, no, you don't understand. It's a natural process. And as a kid, you're just like, that's stupid. You know, why is it a natural process that we should all get this disease that makes us so debilitated? And so that was the time when I woke up to the possibilities. Um, after that, I was very obsessed with aging. I really wanted to learn everything I could. And so I went on the internet and I looked up, you know, what do people know about aging science? And the first thing that came up was this woman called Cynthia Kenyon. And she was a woman scientist at UCSF, a laboratory in San Francisco. And she was working on taking these tiny little worms and changing single genes in them to make them live longer. And I said to myself, well, I have got to meet this person if there's one thing I do. Um, and so when I was 11 years old, I uh, went on my computer, and I think it was the first email I'd ever written to somebody that wasn't my family member. <laughs> and I wrote her and I said, hello, my name's Laura Deming, and I work at, you know, I'm, I sort of a, I'm a 11 year old person in New Zealand, and can I come visit your lab? And within an hour, she wrote back and said, yes. And I remember I ran into my dad's room and I was just screaming on the couch saying, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I get to go be my hero. Um, so to make a long story short, I ended up going to San Francisco. I met her. I ended up working in her lab for two years and then went to college and then um, I was still very obsessed with aging. And so I moved back to San Francisco to start an investment fund to try and help create companies and invest in companies um, that would develop technologies to fight aging mm -hmm. and, and help people live longer, healthy lives. Great. So, so um, as far as I know, you really saw a sort of gap, right? You saw that the system was broken and you felt like, okay, there's all this amazing research going on, but on the funding side of things, I need to change something. So can you maybe explain a little bit more, like, what this funding gap that you, what is this funding gap that you, uh, that you saw? Exactly. So I think this is something that every scientist feels, you know, when you have an incredible piece of research and you're so excited about it, and you're kind of sitting in your lab, like, why are no people coming to me asking me to, you know, begging me to develop my research? Why do I have to go out into the world mm -hmm. and try and find funders? And so to me, the really fascinating thing was, I remember going out to Silicon Valley and going to Sand Hill Road, which is the main um, investment kind of uh, place where folks congregate. And I went and I asked all the VCs, what do you know about aging science? Hmm. And you know, if you asked them what you know about cancer, they would have said, oh, I know everything about cancer. There's KRAS, there's CMIC, there's all these mutations that I know about. But when you asked them about aging, what they said was, that's not a disease. We don't have any science for that. And I was like, that's ridiculous. Because, you know, if you're a scientist in the field, there's decades of research showing that you can change single genes in mice and get increases in lifespan. And so it was just ridiculous to us that these VCs didn't know about this, and we felt this was a problem that should be solved. So to, to be clear, uh, the, there, are, um, uh, um, there are people that say, you know, we believe that humans have some sort of limited lifespan to the age of, let's say, 115, 120 years old. The only thing that we can really do is to create their so-called health span. So the time that people will actually live a healthy life. And then there are other people, like uh, Audrey de Grey, who says, no, we're going to live for at least 800 years. Maybe even forever. What's your, what's your stake on this? What, what do you, oh, what do you think? Oh, that's a good question. I, so I don't have a strong stake on it, because yeah. I think um, the science will decide, and it's important to let the science come through. 
But what I can say is, in worms, you can make single genetic mutations. So you can change one gene and get a tenfold increase in lifespan. And that, to me, is really exciting. Like, this is one gene that you're changing, and you can increase the lifespan of the worm by tenfold. The interesting thing, of course, is that you can take that same or homologous gene to that one, and in mice, change the same thing and get approximately a two-fold increase in lifespan. OK, wait a minute. So that means that we all have to engineer ourselves, right? We need to make not necessarily knockouts in babies. Or no. what, what's, what's going on here? So that's the interesting thing. Yeah. In organisms that we can genetically engineer, that's, of course, our preferred strategy. But a lot of these proteins are actually things we already have inside of us, so proteins that are circulating in our blood even today. And just increasing the levels of those proteins in mice can result in similar increases in lifespan. Mm, cool. So you can imagine a therapeutic like insulin, where it's a protein that you already have circulating in your blood, you're just engineering it and re-injecting it at higher quantities, which is kind of an exciting vision. Very cool. So uh, some of the companies that you're backing with your fund, uh, what, what kind of companies are these? Are they, very, are they focusing on a particular technology? Are they very diverse? What's your portfolio like? Yeah, so they're a very diverse uh, set of companies. One of them actually spoke at this event last yeah. year, uh, Ned David from Unity Biotechnology. I think what they're doing is very exciting. So they're taking the 1%, the oldest of the old of all of your cells, and they're just getting rid of those cells completely. And they say, if we just take your oldest cells and we get rid of them, can we reverse or stop a lot of the diseases of aging that would otherwise occur. And what's very exciting is if you look at their results, they can make mice live 30% longer than normal by just getting rid of these cells. And isn't that exciting? I mean, that's not something that I as a biologist would have expected, but if you look at the data, it's there. So that's one example of a company. We have other companies that are working on things like small molecules. So if you're familiar with mTOR, there's a pathway in your body that basically responds to eating food. It says, oh, you're eating food. Um, that's good. I don't have to work to repair a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. But if you restrict your calories, so if you eat less, sometimes you can live longer. And in a lot of organisms, we see that that's the case. And so some of our companies are targeting the pathway that controls that to be able to make you feel like you're on a diet without actually having to restrict the number of calories that you eat. Mm. That's great. Yeah, because <laughs> that's one of the things that I was wondering about, actually. I mean, knowing what you know, um, what, what are certain lifestyle changes oh, that no. you actually made? So and I what always, maybe yeah. some of the other people would be interested in uh, doing as well if they want to so live longer? It's a great question, and I wish that I had a really good answer. But I think the reason that I'm working on what I'm working on today is I think you know, right now there's not a lot of great stuff out there. And yeah. so hopefully we can change that. Um, probably eating moderately is the best thing that I could recommend. Um, but that might be more of a problem where I live in the US than here, hopefully. Yeah. Oh, in, French, in France, they like good food, but they <laughs> are also quite moderate with their portions. So that's, uh, that's maybe a good thing. Um, but what can we expect? So all these technologies, what stage are they? Like, when, when can we expect them to enter the consumer market? Yeah, so this is the really exciting thing. So there are already two drugs that have been approved and are taken by humans today that have been shown in mice to make them live approximately 10% longer than normal. So already today, there are drugs on market that we think have the possibility of extending lifespan. Mm -hmm. And if you look at some retrospective studies in humans, you can see that they decrease rates of things like uh, sort of different age-related diseases. Um, we have yet to do prospective studies, but this is a very exciting signal. Um, in terms of our companies, most of them are in the preclinical stage, and what that means is they haven't put their drugs into humans yet, but they selected drugs that they want to do that with, and so they're kind of on the track to be able to do their first human testing in the coming kind of couple of years, oh, that's which great. is very exciting for us. And speaking about clinical trials, so if you want to test if a drug actually has an effect to the life of, uh, of humans, I can imagine that those clinical trials can take, I mean, forever, right? They yeah. can take a very long time. So How do they deal with that? So this is a great point. So for the longest time, one of the biggest problems with aging research is we'd say, all right, we have this great drug, and we want to test it in humans, and let's wait 100 years, right? Nobody's going to do that. Yeah. But one of the exciting things about the past couple of years in the field has been the emergence of what we call aging biomarkers. Mm -hmm. And what that means is um, things in the blood that you can measure, so levels of protein, or what kind of methylation pattern your DNA has undergone, or different other sort of metabolic uh, sort of signals that are correlated with both chronological and biological age. 
And what that means is, in the future, instead of looking at total number of years alive or total number of years healthy as a metric for how something's impacting the aging process, you could instead look at these blood-based biomarkers to get an immediate readout on how your therapy was affecting the aging process. Very cool. So uh, what are the things that you're mostly excited about? Is there anything particular that you think is going to be oh, the holy gosh. grail? Or, or is it going to be a combination of things that we need to take our whole life, uh, lifestyle changes, uh, cer certain drugs that we continuously take to prevent diseases from happening? Like, are we going to end up with a battery of pills that we need to take every day uh, to, yeah. to make this happen? Or do you think that there's some very, like some key technologies that can already have that effect? So I think one of the most exciting things just coming from the field is, you know, um, as somebody who grew up in the kind of the field of aging research, I always just think, oh, you know, all the best discoveries will come from the field. And, you know, we know all the best labs that are working on aging, and that's where the great ideas will come from. But one of the fascinating things, I think, investing in this space has been the best ideas that we've seen have all come from outside of the field of aging. So mm. somebody in a diabetes lab or in a migraine lab will find some kind of therapy, they start testing, and they'll do a safety test, and they'll give it to mice for their whole life to make sure it doesn't kill them early. And what they'll see instead is it actually makes them live longer. And so it's really exciting, because I think we absolutely have no clue. I mean, just the number of different things I've seen, we were like, there's no way that would impact aging. Oh, wait, it really impacts aging. Like, that's interesting. Has just been absolutely enormous. And none of them have come from our traditional expected set of therapies. And so my hope and anticipation is that the best things, the most exciting things, will all come from you know, some kind of you know, gut sort of uh, targeted therapy or some, some random thing that we don't think has anything mm. to do with aging but ends up being core to the process unexpectedly. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. So um, if you look at the space, how, many, how far is the science? Why is there such a buzz around this field now all of a sudden? It looks like... Yeah. The all of a sudden, there are biotech companies around this field, uh, whereas before there were not so many. And uh, why do you think the field is more ready? And what can you say to some of the scientists or uh, biotech entrepreneurs who might be interested in joining this field? Yeah, so I think this is the really exciting thing about this field. So if you look at cancer, for example, right? You know, since the early 1900s, we've talked about cancer, we've had some knowledge of the underlying biological processes, and certainly in the past 50 years, we've had large strides in cancer. Aging is an incredibly young field, which is kind of ironic, by comparison, the first genetic mutation that we had ever found to impact the aging process, kind of in a notable fashion, was in 1993. So less than, you know, sort of 30 years ago, we're getting the first evidence that we can actually impact aging. This field is incredibly young, and that's why you're only seeing, I think today, a lot of that science being mature enough to start taking into the clinic. Mm. I think one of the amazing things about this particular point in history is we don't know um, what will happen. It could be the case that all the science that we've been working on fails to translate miserably, and nothing works, and we can't actually impact aging humans. That's completely a possibility. But the exciting kind of case is that actually the things that make mice live longer and make flies live longer and make sort of worms live longer, um, the same things that we see overrepresented in human centenarians actually are impactful and that we can change them to make us live longer. And so it's an open question, and I think that's why you're seeing Art Levinson, Craig Venter, a lot of the most influential and erudite people in biotech starting kind of billion-dollar companies in this space. It's the promise and the potential are so large that it wouldn't make sense for them to miss it. Yeah, so what you're saying, right, so a lot of the, uh, the, 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 the therapies that will be developed are not necessarily, I mean, Aging could be some sort of beneficial side effect, right, of all the other good stuff that they're doing if they cure cancer or diabetes or Alzheimer's disease, etc. Um, so uh, there's probably um, a, a lot more maybe among us than uh, that we already know that could actually help us to live a lot longer. That's super exciting. Wow. Okay. So... Um, 
What do you think is very important for scientists actually to tackle? Are there some fundamental questions that science should look at more? Because oh. I'm just thinking about the audience. You know, we have everyone here. So, so yeah. what should what some of these people here work on to help also the entrepreneurs developing their technologies and to you know, give them a bit of extra understanding of uh, how they can improve their technologies? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so I think there are so many different things that's really hard. I mean, if you think about cancer as a field, right, it's worked on and it, it takes up billions of dollars of research funding per year. And, and aging is, I think, in my personal opinion, an even larger, more complex field. So the number of things to work on is just absolutely insane. But I would say some basic things are, one, a question, is aging genetically regulated? Are there core genetic switches that can modulate the aging process in both worms and flies and mice, but also in humans? Mm -hmm. And can you find that data by looking at genetic correlations with longevity in humans? Um, can you find modular pathways that you can uh, sort of flip a switch and see an increase in lifespan? That's one component. I think another component is just the accumulation of damage, things like senescent cells. Are there specific things that build up in the body with age that were never meant to be there, where if we target them and get rid of them, we can actually impact aging and increase total lifespan and health span? So that's another track of questioning. And then I think a third track of questioning that's very useful to work on, but actually not relevant to aging, is just platform biology. Um, things like gene therapy that have taken a long time to kind of have their day and may you know, just now be starting to kind of take off. Um, are actually hugely impactful for aging, because a lot of the stuff that we'd love to do, we can't without those technologies. So more work on basic biological platforms is actually equivalently useful. So let's assume this all works out, OK? Let's, let's say, yes, we have all these therapies. We live, let's say, at least 120 years or, or more, super healthy. Um, who's going what, what's gonna, to what's gonna be the impact of this on our society? Because that's, that's gonna be, this is going to be a big thing. <laughs> yeah, so I would say, you know, just to be clear, I don't know. It could be the case that none of the things that we're working on just sort of pan out. But if they do, I would say the thing that motivates me the most is the idea that someone like my grandma, who I respect more than anyone and who I think has the wisdom of, you know, the kind of person that I'd love to be around full time, um, could come with me to a, a nightclub and go out dancing or that we could, we could have dinner together and somebody would ask if we were sisters. Like the idea that somebody that you want to spend all your time with that you respect as an elder could also kind of be your friend in a kind of more direct way. That it's kind of an odd thing to say, but I think those kinds of visions are very impactful and exciting when I think about why this is an interesting field to work in. And do you think that this technology could be accessible for everyone? Do you think it's cheap enough to, to make sure that everyone has the ability to extend their life? Or oh, do you think it will... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah? I mean, I would say a lot of medicines, when they're first approved, are quite expensive, maybe on the order of $10,000, some a lot more than that per year. But oftentimes, if the medication can be taken by everybody, pharma companies will try as hard as possible to make sure that everybody who can take it takes it. Yeah. And so in this case, with something that's most likely going to be applicable to the whole population, um, there would be huge economic pressure, um, such as with a drug like Lipitor, to make sure that it's in wide use as opposed to only for a select group of individuals that actually maximizes economic benefit to the company creating it. So, so last question. I just want to know if, because you're a young fund, uh, uh, what you're doing is, uh, is, is, I can imagine, challenging as well. So what do you need? Is there, is there anything that we can do to help you? Yeah, more succeed? great ideas. Great, more, great ideas. more great ideas in this space or even in related spaces. We, I think learning about how biology works is our number one goal. And so any great ideas are always what we're on, on the prowl for. Cool. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Laura Deming. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Yeah.